We're in Luke, Luke 11. So turn there and today we're going to look at verses 14 through 26. There's a longer, really, this is part of a longer uh, unit of the gospel. And uh, in the perfect world, with the perfect teacher, we would cover uh, the whole thing uh, today. But we're going to pick up, Lord willing, uh, the balance of it from uh, verse 27 uh, to 36 in in our next lesson. But our, our passage today takes place as Jesus is continuing his uh, ministry throughout the region of Galilee, with Luke now describing uh, this incident that uh, took place surrounding a powerful miracle the Lord performed in casting out a demon from uh, a man possessed and miserable. Uh, Both Matthew and Mark uh, also uh, include this incident in their Gospels, Uh, And that's an indication uh, that it, um, not that everything in the Bible is not important, but I think it is an indication. It's it's especially instructive. It's important uh, for us to understand what happened this day. So we need to pay special attention to it. When we arrive at verse 14, our Lord has just given some teaching on the importance of prayer and how our Heavenly Father is ready to respond to our prayers and to give us good gifts. When we ask Him, I have to tell you that since we covered that passage and I tried to teach it, uh, I've been cognizant, very aware of of my own prayers and um, pleading with God and uh, knowing that He he listens. had an effect upon uh, me. So, um, but he gives us good gifts, including the greatest gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now Luke describes an entirely different type of spirit beginning in verse 14. So let's read it. And he was casting out a demon and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. And this is where the uh, unity of the larger passage comes into play, because we won't be uh, reading the part where he, he, he expands on that. So these others, uh, to test him, were... Uh, demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. Literally, uh, he carries the idea of a kingdom being divided against itself to a house, but it's a house uh, upon a house uh, falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, notice he considers uh, the, the, the man, the, the person, the, his dwelling place. I will return to my house from which I came. and. Uh, And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. 
Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Switzerland is uh, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. I know there are many beautiful places in the world, and you all have your, your favorites. But I think that when one thinks of Switzerland, its beauty is one of the first thoughts that come to mind. The deep uh, blue lakes, the snow-capped Alps, chocolate, uh, perhaps, certainly. Uh, I've only been to Switzerland one time, but I remember uh, sailing across Lake Lucerne uh, on a schooner, uh, docking and then disembarking at this little village, uh, this little hamlet, uh, and no one, absolutely no one there to greet us or in sight, and as the schooner motored away, the only sound we heard was cowbells uh, clanging uh, from up the hills. The next day, we took a gondola up to the top where the peaks soared up above us, and we hiked in the crisp mountain air under a cloudless, sunny sky. And that's what I think of when I think of, of Switzerland. Perhaps you do too. But Switzerland is noteworthy also for something entirely different. It's unwavering neutrality amidst the turmoil among nations throughout history. Uh, the nation's official policy since the Treaty of Paris in 1815, but really with its origins going back to the 16th century, is to not be involved in armed or political conflicts between rival states. Uh, through two world, war, world wars and countless other conflicts, uh, Switzerland has maintained a policy of neutrality that uh, the wavering at times persists through today, uh, through uh, uh, World War II, and uh, surrounded by the evil of Nazi Germany at war with innocent neighboring countries, Switzerland uh, was steadfast in refusing to take sides. In fact, they continued throughout the war uh, to trade with both the Allied and uh, the Axis powers and, and reap benefits from that commerce. The day will come, however, and there's evidence that it's beginning to fray already when neutrality will finally become impossible and even the citizens of the peaceful and pleasant nation of Switzerland will discover that their sense of security was fragile and fleeting. That's not something I wish upon that beautiful uh, country, but I do think it is true. Jesus was not one for neutrality. He stated that clearly in this confrontation with his enemies in verse 23, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. The issues at play and the differences that separated Jesus from those who opposed him were not inconsequential and they were not matters of indifference. They were rather truth and falsehood, authority and illegitimacy, and above all, the rightful standing the man Jesus commanded from the world into which he had entered. Men and women are by nature uh, evil. That's not a very popular uh, idea, not a politically correct thing to say, but it's how the Bible describes our situation, and it was the view of Jesus himself. Uh, the verse just before our passage, verse 13, look back there, uh, though we didn't dwell on it at length in our previous lesson, uh, reveals our Lord professing that very thing, though in a somewhat offhanded way, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts uh, to your children. Wherever the righteous Lord went, he encountered evil, and he invariably did things that drew the distinction in a way that demanded a response. And we see that in the incident of the exorcism of the demon and his enemy's response to it. 
There were witnesses to it, and they were compelled to choose between the good, Jesus, and the truth he proclaimed, and the good deed he performed, and the evil that came of Satan and his demons. Luke sets the stage for this particular incident in verse 14 with a simple description, and he was casting out a demon. And then he goes on to give uh, some detail, and it was mute. Uh, when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. The crowds were amazed because they knew the man really was a deaf mute. And now, after Jesus' miracle, the man really could talk. That's why they were amazed. I think it's important we say that. There's no mention of doubt coming from anyone in the account. Even Jesus' enemies don't dispute it. Uh, Jesus overpowered the demon, uh, Satan's agent, and he was forced to withdraw. And the deaf man felt it in his bones, we might say. The world around became alive and in great relief. He proceeded to talk. But there were some there witnessing this who opposed him. Uh, Matthew and Mark tell us that they were Pharisees and scribes who had come uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, their reaction uh, was harsh and evil. Uh, they make two charges against him. First, that he was casting out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, and then also some of them, in an attempt to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. And I've said it when we were reading the scripture, Jesus is going to answer that second uh, demand later in the chapter, beginning with verse 29. But here he takes the worst charge uh, first. Beelzebul was a popular name at the time for the prince of the demons. I think that's the most basic thing we could say. The name has a rather rich linguistic background going back to Ugaritic texts, uh, but also the Old Testament. It was as Beelzebub that the false god Baal was worshipped in the Philistine city of Ekron. Uh, and it was identified as such by the Lord in 2 Kings chapter 1, the name possibly meaning something like Lord of the Flies. It's not certain because the name is spelled variously in different texts, but what is certain is that Jesus' critics uh, meant for it to stand for, for Satan. Therefore, they were stooping to the most vile form of blasphemy, so implying that, yes, Jesus had cast out the demon, but he had done it only because he was Satan's toady, uh, performing only what Satan empowered him to do. That's how blind these Jewish leaders were, and it reveals how much they hated uh, Jesus. For all the reasons that we've identified many times before, his transparent purity, his kindnesses, his meekness and compassion, uh, the authority that, with which he taught and interacted with the massive crowds that came to hear and see him, uh, all of that, for all those reasons, they jealously attacked him, for they knew that none of those attributes could be found in them. But Jesus knew their thoughts. Uh, Luke states that in verse 17. He would often read people's minds in that way. That's an interesting study for another time. But somehow he knew uh, what they were thinking. Uh, therefore, he knew the slander in their hearts. And were he any other man, he would have uh, certainly responded as you and I would have with rage and, and anger and a, a, a deep desire uh, to get back at them and to justify himself. Instead, in great reason, he reasons with them. They weren't making sense. I mean, you, that's going to be his argument. You're not making sense. Any kingdom divided against itself, he says, is laid waste, and a house divided against itself 
falls. Uh, a kingdom riven with one side opposing the other will eventually become desolate. This is especially true of an evil uh, kingdom. If it's divided with its leader, Bilzebul, taking sides against his former allies, then his kingdom will not stand. It's the classic case of what we call a house divided. House upon house or house after house uh, will tumble to the ground. So uh, Jesus sets forth his premise. And then he applies it in verse 18. If Satan now also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by the prince of demons, Bilzebul. Again, that makes no sense. For the leader of an army, I'm reading a biography now of one of America's great uh, general, so this resonates with me. But for the leader of an army to uh, turn upon those who have committed themselves to him and sacrificed for him and pledged loyalty to him, but now sabotage and betray and ostracize them, why, they will rise up in rebellion and his army will disperse and scatter and the leader will forfeit his position, fall from power, and slouch away in disgrace. That's what will happen. This is no mere illustration. It is what Jesus' enemies have accused him of. For remember, he really did cast the demon out of the poor man. No one uh, disputes it. In fact, there were others, uh, judging by verse 19, who had, in theory at least, themselves cast out uh, demons. Again, he, he challenges the logic of their accusation. If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they'll be your judges. Ancient writers like Josephus and even Luke himself in Acts 19 in his account of the seven sons of Sceva uh, re reported Jesus's contemporaries performing exorcisms of their own. And it had become commonplace, whether it was true or not, it had become commonplace for people to believe they did it by the power of God. Exactly who the Lord had in mind uh, is unclear, but they were known and they were closely connected with his accusers. They were their sons. Uh, were all these two a part of Satan's self-destructive ruse? It's nonsensical. And then in verse 20, having proved the absurdity of their claim, Jesus states the obvious. His power is sourced elsewhere. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, God doesn't have a literal uh, finger. Your Bible students, you know that. Your theological students, you know that. That is a type of anthropomorphism. He doesn't have a literal finger. Jesus knew it. And these leaders from Jerusalem, they, they knew it uh, also. But his allusion to God's finger was intended to bring to mind an historical and memorable incident in the history of Israel when the revered Moses had delivered the nation from captivity in Egypt through the Exodus. God had given Moses these great powers to perform supernatural signs that brought these plagues upon Egypt. Uh, they increased in intensity so that eventually you know, remember early the Pharaoh's magicians were duplicating somehow uh, the, the, these, these plagues, these, these miraculous signs. But eventually, even his magic, magicians could only conclude and warn Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So Jesus is inviting his enemies to consider the consequences of their conduct. He had... Uh, the same delivering power that Moses had because his power was God's power. Can you imagine uh, these enemies of his hearing this 
and, and thinking of what he is claiming. His power was God's power. His action in casting out the demon was God's action. So they had blasphemed God by attributing his power to Satan. And if he brought with him God's power, then that was evidence that the kingdom of God had come upon them. So this was merciful uh, revelation to men blinded by hate and spiritual obtuseness. They were in the presence of the kingdom of God. And though Jesus doesn't say it expressly, that kingdom was to be found in him. He had put its power on display in the life of that demon-possessed man. But then Jesus bores in more in verses 21 and 22 with an illustration from real life. It's a small parable in which Jesus compares Satan to the most powerful man, armed with a full arsenal of weapons and therefore secure. He is secure and he is able to guard his house and keep all his a possession safe. He is a tower of strength, this man, this in the story. And all is well until someone stronger even than him comes along. Jesus states the situation in plain terms in verse 22, but when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and then distributes uh, the plunder. That's what Jesus had actually done. He is the stronger man, uh, and he had attacked the seemingly secure bastion of strength that was the demon-possessed dumb man's physical body. He had attacked the strong uh, but weaker and evil ruler of the demons by driving out the demon indwelling the man. As I say, it's a story uh, taken from the stuff of real life. Uh, countless movies have been made in pattern after this very idea. A, a wicked villain, powerful and malicious, uh, terrorizing a family or a city or a nation. And the situation as it unfolds is, is frightening. It, it's seemingly hopeless until the hero uh, enters the scene, and you only thought you'd seen strong before the hero enters. He's stronger still, and he puts his strength on display and makes all the wrongs uh, right again. You know, men flock to these movies, and sometimes they drag their wives and girlfriends uh, along with them. Uh, taken. You know that movie? Taken. These bad, bad men, uh, powerful men, uh, kidnap this pretty young lady, uh, and they take her and they stow her in a secure place. It's impen impenetrable, and forcing drugs upon her, and they're preparing her to be their sex slave. But they only thought it was secure, because here comes Liam Neeson, the girl's father, and it turns out he is the stronger man, and he ravages these evil men, and he rescues his daughter. They didn't know it, but they never had a, a chance. There's a big difference, however. Uh, what Jesus was doing was real. Uh, action hero movies are pretend, uh, made-up stories, designed to appeal to people like me because of our sense of justice and desire for comeuppance for the bad guys. And I hope that you don't think I would trivialize what really is holy ground. What Jesus was alluding to was his incredible victory over Satan. Satan is strong, Jesus is stronger. His casting out of the demon was a mere earthly demonstration. The ultimate and actual means of Jesus' victory over Satan is the cross. 
That is where the climax to the great conflict ultimately took place. Analyzing what uh, he says in verse 22 more carefully, uh, Jesus' work on the cross was really a hostile and frontal attack upon the devil. At the cross, Jesus overpowers him. He disarms him by taking away his weapons and armor. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. When Christ died on the cross, he bore our sins and our guilt upon himself, and he left Satan with nothing to attack us. The Apostle Paul made use of the same imagery in Colossians 2.15, saying, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. But notice Jesus also insists, again in verse 22, he distributes Satan's plunder. And again, Paul uh, writes in Ephesians 4, verse 8, quoting from Psalm 68, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. These are the gifts that you and I uh, have, that we've been given by virtue of Christ's victory to be used in his service. These are the gifts. This is the plunder, uh, the gifts that each one of us have. This is total victory, Jesus is asserting. Everything the devil believed he had amassed was seized by our Lord Jesus at the cross. His rule had been nothing but a house of cards, and now God's incipient kingdom would irrepressibly shine until coming to its fruition at the king's second coming. So far from being the enabling agent of Beelzebul, Jesus was his overwhelming enemy. Now, in Matthew's account, uh, Matthew identifies some in the observing crowd who were not only amazed, as Luke characterizes it, but they were actual, actually wondering aloud whether Jesus might be the promised son of David who was to come. You go there, they weren't ready to openly profess that, uh, but neither did they agree that his power had its source in the devil. They were riding the fence line between belief and skepticism. The Lord, of course, knew that, and he forcefully addresses it in verse 23, saying, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. This is the universal call. It's not just the call for America. It's not just a call for the West. This is the universal call, and it's the next logical main idea after Jesus' self-identification as the mighty conqueror of Satan. Considering the, the weightiness of Jesus' claim and the reality of it, there can be no middle ground in responding to it. One cannot remain a, a neutral, kind of friendly, uncommitted observer. It is directed at every man and woman who has ever lived. If you are not with Jesus, he considers you to be against him. Indecision is not an option. There can be no middle ground. A side must be taken. In the same way, he who will not join in to help him gather in sheep for his kingdom. It doesn't matter how many uh, philanthropic organizations you're a part of, uh, no matter how much uh, money uh, you have uh, given to help the poor, how much money you've given to charitable causes. If you're not helping him gather, you're actively scattering the sheep. This has always been God's way. Joshua challenged Israel as they had entered into the promised land. Choose, he said, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. 
the people were commanded to choose. You've got to make your choice. Ruth uh, swore to Naomi, I will not leave you, for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. She remained true to her word. There was no fence riding for Ruth, and God greatly uh, blessed her. We could go on and on. Just one more. Elijah on Mount Carmel uh, challenged the people of Israel. How long will you hesitate between uh, two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. You know what it says there? And the people didn't answer him a word. They wouldn't take a stand. They wouldn't do it. They would not choose. A refusal to take a stand is timeless. I know it's not a generational uh, issue, but it does seem, we always think it's more worse today, don't we? But it does seem more prevalent today than ever before, especially in an upwardly mobile uh, place like Dallas, Fort Worth, and in an environment like ours, uh, rubbing elbows with all these people who think they have the world by the tail, it's tempting to believe you can have it all, that, that you can have it both ways. You can dip your toe into religion, which so many people do, talking about, I'll, I'll, men, I'll, I'll mention that in my Bible study. Um, I'll, mention, I'll put that in, uh, you know, a man in my church, this, that, and the other. But... Uh, so you can do that, uh, being sure not to get into deep, too deep, while on the other hand you belong truly, wholly to the world with all its distractions. Jesus calls people to an undivided devotion. With the 24th verse, <clears throat> the Lord begins to relate a story about a man who had been delivered from an unclean spirit. This is another Jewish term for a demon, for one of Satan's henchmen. And it's unlikely he has in mind the demon-possessed man of verse 14, for that man had <clears throat> been freed of the demon by uh, the Lord. While in this story, it's not clear exactly if the evil spirit had been actually exorcised or if it had merely left of its own uh, will. Uh, desert lands were popularly uh, regarded as likely abodes of the evil spirits. So in his story, notice, uh, the Lord uh, pictures this one, wandering through a place like that, seeking rest, uh, but not finding any. So then determining, determining that it will simply uh, return to the house from which it came. It's significant that when it returns, it finds its former home swept and put in order. What a pleasant surprise. So then, uh, sadly, the demon goes and he takes along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go and they live there and then the Lord relates that the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. And so it was a warning, obviously. The picture is of a person who has been under the spell of Satan for a period of time, but who for some reason or another is freed from that oppression. Uh, though not stated expressly, he appears now able to relax uh, reflect upon the mess of his life and go about the process of reforming himself in order to clean up his disheveled life and, and make it uh, presentable. Do you know people like that? I do. So he describes a behavioral cleanup. It, it's cosmetic, uh, swept and put in order. You know, we often deride those kinds of surface remodels as putting lipstick on a pig. Uh, be sure you don't look too closely because it is a moral reformation, but not a spiritual one. People do put their lives in order for a time because it feels good uh, to do it. It makes them feel better. 
That was a foundational issue with the Jews, if you think about it. Uh, they had created a system of uh, ethical laws and guidelines to help them feel better about themselves, while in reality, they were trading fidelity to their God for self-righteousness. This is, that is a dangerous place to live. It feels good, but it is extremely perilous. I heard a line from a song the other day. It's like a kiss from the lips of a monster. Uh, the kiss seems a desirable uh, thing, but it's the monster on the other end that will determine the outcome of that dalliance. Uh, this man had not truly repented or had an experience with the Spirit of God, but rather had a dalliance with self-delusion. And now the monster on the other end had arrived with the bill. The kingdom of God is not about moral housekeeping that whitewash makes appealing for a while. It brings a final cleans cleansing, the kingdom does, that is real because it comes from God. It is spiritual and it cleans from within. Well, this confrontation uh, between Jesus and the Jewish leaders went exactly where the Lord wanted it to go. He was the son of God who had come with a mighty mission to destroy the works of the devil and to seek and to save that which was lost. Instead of believing and accepting him, they hated him and blasphemed him in the most heinous way possible, regarding him as the weak underling of Satan. So he laid down the gauntlet, uh, first with the bold claim to be the strong conqueror of the devil, and then by demanding the allegiance of all who heard him, only then would they know the power of God and experience his kingdom. This should be a challenge to everyone who hears these words, to everyone who reads uh, this passage. You call it throwing down the gauntlet, if you like. Have we committed ourselves to him? Have we made the choice to truly serve the Lord? Or have we declared ourselves to be neutral for fear of danger of commitment? Are we missing the blessings of declaring aside? The strong man won the victory on the cross of Calvary and he calls us to place our complete trust in him and in his victory. And then we ask, do our lives uh, reflect the self-oriented, feel-good moralism of the society we live in or have our hearts been changed, filled with God's Holy Spirit, empowering us to join in with the King in his gathering up of citizens for his kingdom. It is our daily challenge every day, today, tomorrow, the next day, to prove up our true allegiance and make known to the people with whom we come in contact that we have chosen a side. We serve the King. Let's pray. Lord, we often fail, <clears throat> even all of us here who have chosen a side, you have enabled us to do that by quickening us, by regenerating us and giving us new birth so that we might be able to say, yes, Lord, I side with you, I believe you, I trust in you. And yet we know that we're challenged uh, each day uh, by adherence to that decision, uh, by faithfulness to you. And it is our prayer, I know it's the prayer of every person in here, it is our prayer that as we go forth uh, each day, more and more, we show our faithfulness to this evil world in which we live, and we reveal to them uh, that we belong to Jesus, we identify with Jesus. We pray in his name, amen.